Morning, everybody. Part six. Part three. Part three of four. There's not six. There's only four. <laughs> One more after this week. We're on growth this week. How many need any areas of growth in your life? Right? We all probably do in something. Um, but, but before I get into that, uh, for those of you who are in the building, if you're online, you probably don't know this, but for those of you who are here, you notice things are a little different in here. There's some open areas. And the reason for the open areas is really a step of faith for us as a church. Calvary Faith Center has always been built on a foundation of prayer. If you go back to the days when we were in the park, and uh, many of you saw kind of a little bit of the history a few weeks or a, I guess a month or so ago now. It seems like time flies when you're having fun. But um, anyway, it was built on prayer. There was a lot of prayer meetings that happened in the beginning. There's still a lot of prayer meetings that happen every week. So we are a church that believes and is and has got a foundation of prayer. And not too long ago, someone, a dear friend, told me of something that they had seen and they had felt from the Lord. And it talked about prayer. It talked about healing. It talked about people being set free, hands being laid on, and people being set free. And these areas that you see that are open here, and the reason I called it a step of faith is because I believe from the moment that that, prophetic word was given to me, it started my mind on what God had for us. And what God has for us in these areas is that I have a, a belief inside my heart, and I hope you will join me in this and praying it and, and, and believing for it, is that these areas every Sunday will be filled with people who are here to receive release. They will be able to receive healing. They will be able to receive what it is that God has for them. And that's why we've done this. We've opened up these areas for people to come and to be healed. What did Jesus say? The healthy don't need the doctor. It's the sick that need the doctor. And I see these areas as a hospital in a sense. It's an area where people can come and experience the love and the, the healing power of Jesus. And so I ask you to partner with us as a church family to pray for this, to pray into it, and thank God for what he is going to do, because I believe it's going to happen. I believe there's going to be, be a day that there will be more people in those two areas here in the building than will be sitting in these chairs. And I say that because all of you will be a part of that too. If you have what you need, you will be a part of praying for those people. You will be a part of, praying, of laying on of hands Jesus said, freely you have received, now freely give. Each and every one of us should be praying and continuing to believe that we have freely received what Jesus gave to us so that we can freely give that to those who are coming. And all that being said, if you are here and you need that, when you come in in the morning, that's the area to hang out in, either over here or back there. And I ask all of us, if we see somebody hanging out in that area, go pray for them. Go ask them what it is that you can believe with them for. The healing, the power that Jesus has can go through us. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in each and every one of us. And God wants us to, to, to release that to those who are in need. So as we go through worship each week, what a more wonderful time to be set free. There's no reason we got to wait till the end of service to help somebody get set free, right? There's no reason to sit here for an hour and a half when you have a need. The minute you come in the door, get the need met. <laughs> get it taken care of. And then we've got 20 or 30 or 40 minutes to praise Jesus and thank him for all that he's done. So I'm going to ask you that if you feel on your heart, I know we all pray, but if you feel that extra thing inside of you that says, you know what, I just love to pray. I have it in me. God has put it in me. Come and talk to Kim or I and let us know if you'd be willing to be that person or those people who keep an eye on those areas during church in the morning to just say, you know what, if there's a need and I see somebody back there, I'll go. I'll go because we need you. We need you for that. And secondly, those of you that are online, we haven't forgot about you either. We're also wanting to 
be available for you. So if you need anything, if you need any prayer, now I know on social media and on Facebook and all that, it's kind of hard to put, you know, your, your exact prayer. But that's okay. If you just ask for prayer, we can pray for you. God knows what it is. We don't always have to be specific. Now, if you need to get specific, you can direct message us and let us know, and we'd be happy to connect with you that way. But you can just let us know that you need prayer for something, and we can lift you up. So I'm asking those of you in here, too, if you're good at social media, you like getting on Facebook, you like getting on YouTube, the two places that we live stream our services, just log on to it in the morning and see if there's anybody in there that's asking for prayer. And if there is, acknowledge them and pray for them. I've, I've recently been doing something that God has put on my heart. He showed it to me through somebody else, but I think it's so powerful. I never knew this, but on Facebook, you can actually record your voice and send it as a direct message. I don't know if you know that or not, but it's pretty cool. So you can actually pray a verbal prayer, record it, and then send it as a message to somebody in Facebook. I, th I think you can do that in Instagram too, maybe. I don't know. Maybe somebody younger than me can let me know that. But it's a powerful thing. Instead of just saying, yes, I'm praying for you, and there's nothing wrong with that, but actually recording the prayer, like if they're standing right there with you, recording it and sending it to them, and let them listen to it, and hear the word. Speak the word of God, the truth, over that prayer. And then you have it forever. You can play it again. If you ever feel a down moment, go back. Oh, I remember when Debbie prayed for me or when Fran prayed for me or Chico prayed. I remember. I'm going to go back and listen to it. And it's there. There's power. All these tools that have been exposed to us, let's start using them for the good to bless people and help them to receive what it is that God has for them. So let's pray. Can you guys pray with us? As we go through these next few weeks and months, pray, see what God would have for you. And if you want to be a part of those prayer teams, whether on social media or in the back here, just come and let Kim or I know. We'd love to have you be a part of that with us. So we sang the song, he won't fail, right? He won't fail. As I'm singing that, it hit me for the first time. I know that sounds silly, but it hit me for the first time. He won't fail fail ever 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 is that inside of you do you believe that do you believe that there's nothing that Jesus will ever fail at when we read his promises how many times do we pray prayers and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this but it just it's a mindset we pray prayers asking God to do things he's already said that he's done. I catch myself all the time asking God for things, and then he reminds me in my spirit, it wells up within me and says, Bob, I've already done that. If you want to pray that, thank me for it, because I've already given it to you. You don't have to pray for what you've already been given. If you believe that you have been healed by Jesus. It says you were healed. It doesn't say you might be or, you know, in the by and by. You might. No, it says we were healed by his stripes. That means we are. Like Pastor Art, dad always says, if you were, you are. Prayer. What are we praying? What are we speaking? Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So every time I say something like that and God reminds me, I've already done that, it changes my heart. It helps me to grow. It helps me to grow in the truth that God has for me. And as you continue to go through life and you continue to hear those things from God and he continues to remind you of things. We talked about conviction last week and how often sometimes we get, we get the devil tries to lie to us and say, you know, conviction just means you're messing up all the time. No, conviction is the Holy Spirit drawing us closer to the Heavenly Father who loves you and has created you for good. That's what conviction is. It's not to you know, smack you on the knuckles with a ruler. It's to draw you and show you how much God loves you, how much he has for you, how much he wants to bring you to the place that he sees you. Have you ever stopped to think about what God sees in you? 
really thought about it. Sit down, close your eyes and say, God, show me what you see me as. Show me what you think of me. Show me who you created me to be. Show me that when you said you knew me before the foundation of this world, what did you see? Can you imagine if we were living our life to what he saw before the foundation of this world in each and every one of us? We would not ever believe that he would fail. Because everything that he's put in us, everything that he's given us to do what it is he put us here on this earth to do, he supplied for us. We didn't have to earn it. We didn't have to do a certain number of things before we get there to be able to do it. He just said, that's who you are. That's who I created you to be. And I've given you what you need to do what I created you to do. Now go do it. Why do we not take steps? Oftentimes it's fear. I'm afraid that if I take this step, what's going to happen? So we don't take the step. I've seen this a lot over the last few weeks, and I think it's God speaking to me to remember fear and faith are both F words. And they're both F words that have something for the future, right? Fear... I'm fearing what's coming. I'm fearing what if I take this step, what's going to happen? Faith is also believing that there's something on the other side of that step. One is negative. One is brought to us by God. Which one are we looking at? Are we looking more at the fear or are we looking more at the faith? Takes just as much energy to go either way, right? It takes just as much energy to fear something as it does to have faith in something. So why not take that energy and put it in the faith bucket? Put it in the faith bucket. Trust that God is going to do what he said he would do. Again, what are we praying? A lot of times if we're praying and we're feeling ourselves praying those prayers that God has already taken care of, it means that we're not really trusting. We're not really believing that God's doing what he said he would do in our lives that we would grow. Over the last few weeks on this series uh, in, in our journey that we've been talking about, journey of finding our purpose, we've talked about preparation, what God has done for us, what God has put in us, how he's prepared us. Again, before the foundation of this world, what did he see in us? All of that he's prepared us for. Planting, where are we planted? Are we always looking for something else? Are we always looking saying, this ain't the right place, this doesn't feel right, I'm not gonna be able to do what God's created me to do until I get to this place? Or do we believe that he has us right where he's planted us in this moment to do what he's created us to do in this moment? doesn't mean we're going to stay there for the rest of our lives. It just means that there's purpose in that planting. There's purpose in that place where we are right now. No matter what stage of your life you're in, there's purpose in this moment. You're here for a reason today. When you leave this place today, wherever you go, there's a purpose in that. Whatever you do tomorrow, there's a purpose in that. God has you planted right in that place because he has things for you to bless you, to bless those around you. But do we trust that? Do we have the faith to take those steps and say, God, I'm trusting that when I get up this morning, you are going to direct my path. You are going to lead me. You have prepared me, my heart, my mind, my eyes, my ears, my mouth. Oops, my mouth, my ears. I did that backwards. I have the faith, God, that you're going to do in me what you said you would do. And as I take these steps of faith and I move through my day and I move through my week and my month and my year, that I'm trusting that you're taking me where it is that you've got for me to go. Do we really trust that? If we do, we're growing. We're taking those steps. Now, a lot of times we get in our head, or at least I do, maybe you don't, but I get in my head and think sometimes, boy, I'm not growing enough. I'm not growing fast enough. I want to get to where I where God has for me to go, and I want to get there now. Growing doesn't happen that way. We grow a little bit at a time. No matter how tall you are right now, you didn't instantly get that tall. It took a long time for you to get there, 15, 18, 20 years. We were joking. My daughter was over the other day. She just, she just had a birthday, and she said, man, I've, I, th I think I grew from <laughs> the last time. We hadn't measured her. We were measuring our grandson. We hadn't measured her on the door in a long time. And she's, man, I think I grew since I was 18. <laughs> Maybe she did. I don't know. Maybe we just didn't do it right. Who knows? But we grow. We grow in everything. Our hair grows. Our nails grow. We grow. <laughs> 
Thanks for keeping it light, Chico. We grow, but we don't grow instantly, right? It doesn't happen. Now, growing, speaking of that, Chico, we know that, that growing in our weight, it, it goes a lot quicker when it goes up than it does when it shrinks, right? It's a lot easier to gain five than it is to lose five. But anyway, that's a different area of growth. That's not, that doesn't pertain to our subject matter today. Um, so this week in talking about growth, once we realized that God has prepared us and that he's planted us where, we, where we're supposed to be in this moment, that allows for us to start growing now, right? When you plant something in the ground, you plant a plant, you plant a seed, whatever it is you plant, it gives that plant the opportunity or that seed the opportunity to grow in that place. And so when we acknowledge that God has prepared us, God has planted us, now it's time for us to start growing. Now, we got to be careful about how we think about growing. Again, it's not instant. It doesn't change in an instant. God can do anything, I know. I believe that. But in our lives, there's a purpose behind the slow growth. We often wonder, or at least I do, God, what if you were to just take me where it is that you see me in 10 years? And he says, oh, no, I can't do that because you're not ready for that yet. What I have for you is so much bigger than what you could handle right now. You're not ready. I need you to grow in this time. So whether you're young, whether you're older, wherever you're at in life, wherever you, God has for you to go in the next years, he needs us to grow in that process with him. He needs us to trust that the Holy Spirit is going to lead us and guide us in that thing because it's so big and, and, and amazing and exceeding abundant that we cannot handle it where we're at today. There's a period of time that it's going to take for us to get there. And when we trust and believe that, A, it feels good, right? God has good things. God has exceeding abundance in my future. But the other assuring thing is, is that he's going to give us what we need along the path so that when we get there, we're ready for it. We don't get there and go, oh my gosh, now what do I do? We've got to the point to where we're so trusting in God, we're tr so trusting in what he has done up to that point in our lives, we say in that moment, God, whatever it is that I need for tomorrow, you're going to give it to me because you've already established that as I've grown up to this point. I haven't had to do any of this myself because I've trusted in you. My only job in all of this is to continue trusting and taking the steps as you lead and guide me in this life, trusting that every step of the way, you're going to be there to give me what I need. That's growth. If you think back in your life, something in the last, you know, maybe week, maybe year, whatever it might be, and you say, you know what, God, you brought me a long way from the way I used to think. You've brought me a long way from the way I used to speak, the way I used to act. That's growth. That's growth. I mentioned earlier how in my spirit, how when I pray things that God's already done and he reminds me of that, that's growth. That's showing I may not have the exact words at that moment because I, I prayed something that God reminds me that I've already done for you, Bob. You don't have to pray like that anymore. Thank me for it. Don't ask me for it. You've already got it. But that's growth because now I recognize it. So in your life, what is it that you're recognizing now that maybe you didn't recognize a week ago or a year ago or five years ago? That's growth. That's God leading us to where it is that he has for us to go. And as long as we trust and believe that, we're going to see what it is he has for us. It's when we don't trust it, we don't believe it, that we start taking it on ourselves. We start carrying the burden ourselves instead of giving it to Jesus like he said. Come to me. Let me carry it. When we try to carry it ourselves, we get bogged down. Life gets heavy. I'm sure there's probably people in this room or watching online that are going through some heavy stuff right now. If we try to hold on to that and take it all on ourselves and carry that burden all ourselves, it can get heavy. It can get very heavy. But when we let Jesus have it and let him hold us instead of us trying to hold that burden, instead of us trying to hold that heavy thing of life, he's there to bring us comfort. He's there to bring peace. He said, I give you my peace, the peace that I give, not the peace of the world, but my peace. The peace of Jesus is different than the peace of the world. The peace of the world wants you to do things to fix it, to forget about it. Jesus says, I don't want you to forget about it. I want you to give it to me. Just give it to me. Let me take care of it. Let me handle it. Let me help you grow through this process. Romans 8, 28. Nothing goes to waste. God takes care of it. He works all things together for good. He works them together for good. In the moment, it might feel like, you know what? This is awful. This is horrible. I don't want to deal with it. 
But when we look back on it, we say, you know what, God, even though it was painful, even though it was tough, you brought me through it, and I'm, I'm, I'm better for it now because my mindset is more leaning on you. Do you think Paul and all those guys that got thrown in jail and got beaten with sticks all the time, do you think that they liked that? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think they did. But in the end, what did it do? It drew them closer to knowing that Jesus more and more, even after he was gone. They knew him more because they took that and used it in a different way. They used it to motivate them to know that, you know what, this is hard, yes, but God has something better for me on the other side. God has a blessing not only for me, but to those he draws me to, that he brings me to, that he opens up doors for. That's growth. That's what God wants for us. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Similar to what Christina read earlier today. Just as he chose us in him, we were chosen in Jesus before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That means that's what we were created for. That means that when we receive Jesus into our life and we believe the truth that he represented by coming to this earth and dying for us and giving up his life for us, that we were that, that we are holy and blameless before him. And that allows us to grow the way that God has for us to grow. If we don't believe that, if we don't believe that we were holy and blameless before God the Father because of what Jesus did, again, not because of anything we did, not because of any good that we could do, we're all sinners. We all have fallen short, no matter how good we think we are. We were talking about that in the park the other day, how people will say, oh, they were a good person. Well, yeah, they might have been a good person on our standards, but God is the judge. God is the Holy One. God is the one who created us, created the heavens and the earth. He's the only one that can judge what's holy and what's not. And when we come to Jesus, he says we are. He says we are holy. Again, the growth is in our own mind, getting what's in our heart up into our mind, the things that God has put in us. He said, I've written my laws on your heart we got to get that up into our head because when we do that, it's not that we're, we're spending so much time concentrating on the laws, but we're concentrating on what Jesus did for us because when we come to Jesus and we acknowledge all of that, the law stuff, Jesus said, I come to fulfill the law. I didn't come to get rid of the law, but I came to fulfill it. Well, what does that mean? That means that in Jesus, we have the ability to live the life that God created us for through him. Not through us trying to not do this or not do that or whatever it might be, but in trusting that he is living inside of us. I was talking to somebody recently, and we were talking about doing things, you know, helping people and doing things like that. And in my head, sometimes I get caught up in what the, what's going to happen. You know, if I give this person 10 bucks, what are they going to do with it? And what God showed me in that moment in that discussion was that don't look at it like Bob's doing this thing. I live inside of you is what Jesus told me. Jesus lives in each and every one of us. And so when we do things like that, that's Jesus working through us. And if Jesus says, give that person $10, that means he's wanting to give that person $10. Jesus said, I only do what the Father does. So if Jesus says, give that person $10 and Jesus is inside of you, that means that's what the Father is wanting us to do. But when we look at it from the standpoint of what would the old, what would Jesus do, right? What would Jesus do when he's in you? It quickens, the Holy Spirit quickens you to do what it is that he has for you. And the more that we start trusting that, because I still, I got to be honest, I still, when I feel in my spirit, give somebody money. If it's not somebody I know, I often go, eh, what are they going to do with it? They're going to buy something they shouldn't buy with it. But the growth is that that moment goes by. 
faster. I don't ponder it. I don't sit there. It doesn't take me an hour to figure out, well, should I give them the $10 or should I not? I think it maybe for a moment, but the growth is in doing it quicker, not stewing on it, not going home and going, oh, man, I wish I should have, you know, I should have given them, and then driving 20 minutes to try and find them again. The quicker we get to what God puts in our heart, that's growth. And that's what God wants for us. Oh, boy. Um, Turn with me to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3. The child Samuel was a good example, in my mind, of growth. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 26, so a little bit before what we're going to read now, it says, And the child Samuel grew in stature, and in favor, both with the Lord and men. And as I read that, I believe that God's speaking that over each and every one of us. You could put your name in there. We're all children of God. So just because it says child doesn't mean that it doesn't mean us. So I could read it, and the child Bob grew in stature and in favor both with the Lord and with men. Again, not because of what Bob does, but because of what Jesus has done in my life, what the Holy Spirit, that power of the Holy Spirit living in my life has done. What did Samuel's life look like in growth? How did he get to the place of growing in stature and favor? Those are some things that I think of when I read these things. It says that Samuel grew in stature and favor both. Well, how? What was he doing? What was going on in his life? Why was he he doing that? And I believe it was because he was planted right where God had for him to be, just like we talked about last week. Where are we planted to be? So in, uh, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 3, starting at verse 1, it says, Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And if you want to know about Eli, he's an interesting character, him and his boys. Um, you can go back to chapter 2 and read that. We're not going to, for the sake of time, we're not going to get into that. But they were a little bit um, scandalous. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. There wasn't a lot coming from from the throne room through prophets. And it came time and it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in the, in his place and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he couldn't see and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was and while Samuel was lying down that the Lord called Samuel and he answered and said here I am. So he ran to Eli and said so Samuel runs to Eli and says here I am for you called me. And he said Eli said I didn't call Lie down again. And he went and he laid down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. He answered, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Probably getting a little upset, right? He's trying to sleep, and Samuel keeps waking him up, saying, You called me. Verse 7, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed in him. Interesting, right? We just read... Before that, chapter 2, verse 26, and the child Samuel grew in stature in favor with both the Lord and the men. And men. And now in verse 7, it says, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, hmm. nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. Verse 8, And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he rose and went to Eli, and he said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down. And it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called at, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel, at which both ears of everyone who hear it will tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Wow, pretty heavy for a kid, right? So Samuel laid down until the morning and the doors opened to the house of the Lord and Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision, understandably so. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he answered, here I am. 
So now he's distinguished, right, the voices. He knows Eli from God now at this point. And he said, what is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please don't hide it from me. God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all the things that he said to you. Wow. Talk about pressure on Samuel, right? I got to tell this guy, otherwise it might, all that stuff might happen to me. Then Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. So Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So as we read through that, what did Samuel do? He heard a voice, but he didn't know what it was. He didn't yet know the Lord. He didn't know, so he went to whoever was closest, but ultimately he found out that it was the word of the Lord. As we grow, have you ever asked yourself, is that just me or is it the Spirit? As we grow, those questions, right, those questions come up. I can remember as a young believer, and that, I mean, it happened a lot. The the, the more I get into the Word, the more I know God's Word, the, the, the more I'm quickened to, yep, this is God's voice. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, right? So as we, as we get more accustomed, but, but if you're just growing in this, Sometimes it's like, oh, man, I don't know. Should I give this 10 bucks? Is it just me feeling guilty, or is it really the Spirit in me? And that's what Samuel learned through this. He learned what the voice of God sounded like. He did not close off God's call, even though he didn't know that it was God. He thought it was Eli, yet he was still responding. He was still going. So sometimes in our life, we might hear things. We might hear things, and that's where it becomes important for us to be in tune with the Spirit, because Not always does God's voice come from a source that we would maybe accept it from. Sometimes it's hard to receive words from people we're close to. Sometimes it's hard to receive from people who we might have something going on. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's hard. But it's important for us to bring everything before God, before the Spirit, and say, Spirit, lead me and guide me in this. I'm hearing this. How many know that when you hear something that you really don't want to receive, oftentimes it's the exact thing, the exact thing you need to hear? Nobody? It happens. It happens. The things we fight against the hardest are often the things that God wants us to bring, God wants us, to bring us through. That's what he wants us to grow in because it's hard. The things of God are hard, but he is there to bring us through. And that's where the devil gets in our head and says, oh, that's too hard. You'll never be able to do that. Well, guess what? You don't have to. You just have to lean on God and trust that God is going to get you through it. God is going to give you what you need to get through that situation. We can't get through the stuff that God has for us in our future. We can't get to God's exceeding abundance in our own strength. We have to grow and trust that it's his spirit that moves within us that's going to give us what we need. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And what does that mean? It means when we put our joy in him and we say, God, no matter what it looks like in my life right now, I'm going to be joyful because I know when you are giving me the joy, when the joy comes from you, that that's what's going to give me the strength to get through whatever it is that I need to get through. I'm not doing it on my own. I'm not trying to do it on my own. The devil has lied for so long and continues to lie to people and say, when things are hard in your life, you need to go away by yourself. We weren't created to be by ourselves. Number one, we're created to be next to Jesus. But in this life on earth, we were created to be Jesus for one another. What did we say earlier? We said when Jesus lives in us, he's the one that's doing stuff through us. So when you have that conversation with that person and God tells you to encourage them with love and with with grace and with mercy, that's Jesus in you working through you. We're just the vessel. He's the vine, we are the branches. In a vine, where does the energy, where does the life come from? It comes from the vine. It doesn't come from the branches. You can't cut a branch off and, and have it live. 
but you cut a branch off the vine, the vine still lives. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. He is what flows through us. So all the things that he calls us to do, all those things that we might feel uncomfortable in, those, those conversations or those things where God says, do this, ah, I don't want to fail. Well, you know what? Jesus never fails. But in our life, failure means that we're moving. We're growing. How many of you have ever, have ever grown in anything and not failed? If you have, give yourself a hand. Because I've never done any, anything in my life new that I needed to grow and learn in that I didn't fail. And that's the beauty of our relationship with Jesus is he says, come to me, let me lead you and guide you, let me fill you with what you need, let me direct you, and I will never fail is what Jesus says. So when we have a moment where we feel like, oh, I stumbled or I tripped up, he says, that's all right, I'm here. Come to me, let me pick you up, let me dust you off, and let me help you move forward again. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't stop. When failure comes, it's a signal for us to go to him. Don't lose hope. I'm going to close with this quote. I heard it the other day. It's from a, a pastor. His name's Erwin McManus. He's a pastor in Los Angeles. He's written many books. But when he said this, when I saw this, it, it resonated with me, kind of in what we're talking about today. He said, if your purpose is rooted in your success, your purpose is fragile. If your purpose is rooted in your success, your purpose is fragile. The devil lies to us and tries to get us to say, you failed, so you're not going to live up to your purpose. You're not going to make it because you weren't successful at that. But I believe what he said next is what Jesus would say if he were here. He said, if your purpose is rooted in the person that you become, then it's untouchable. If your purpose is rooted in the person you become, then your, pers your purpose is untouchable. And when we live our life, as who Jesus says that we are, we will continue to grow and become who he created us to be. And in that moment, and in that journey to purpose, our purpose is untouchable. The devil can't take it away because we're trusting in what God said and what Jesus did to give us what we need to be who he created us to be. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you that you sent your son. We thank you that you sent Jesus for us to show us, to teach us all the things that he spoke while he was on this earth. All the truths that you have for us throughout your scripture, throughout your, your life-giving word. We thank you, Lord, that you continue to fill us more and more every day. You help us to grow into who you see us as. You see us as that full-grown creation that you saw us before the foundation of this world. We thank you that you have enough love for us, that you give us everything that we need to continue moving down that path. Your word says when we acknowledge you, that you will direct our path, you will light our path, Lord. And we thank you. Today we acknowledge you in this thing, this life that we live. And we thank you that you are there to faithfully shine your light upon our path, to help us grow, to give us the nutrients, to give us the life, to give us everything we need to grow into who you created us to be. If you're here in the building or you're online this morning and you have not yet said yes to Jesus, you don't even maybe know what we're talking about, about Jesus coming and dying for us. The simple truth is God, the creator of the world, sent his son, Jesus, from the throne to this earth for the sole purpose to die for you, to die for all of us. Because we could not live up to what we needed to live up to to have a relationship with God, to be in, in that place to where we could go into the throne room and sit with him and hear him and to, 
have him love us and care for us. We're not good enough for that. But because of Jesus, he made us good enough for that. He redeemed us. He brought us the salvation that we needed to be able to commune with the God of all creation. Yeah, salvation, saying yes to Jesus will get us to heaven. But that's not the real reason. Because if it were, we'd get saved and we'd die immediately. God said, I created you for a purpose on this earth. You are here on this earth for a reason. And when we put our trust in Jesus and his leading and guiding us, we're going to see that purpose. We've been talking about the journey of purpose over the last few weeks. And that's really what it's about. It's us growing and understanding who God created us to be and what he's put in us to allow us to do what it is that he's created us to do. So just say yes to him. Just say, thank you, Jesus, that you died on that cross for me, that I'm a sinner. I can't do it on my own, but with you in my life, all things are possible. Get connected either here if you're close enough or if you're here this morning with us, get connected with us. If you're online, find a church locally or continue to connect with us online either way, but make sure you continue to ask God and ask him to lead you to more and more of his truth and you get that through his word in the Bible Heavenly Father I thank you for continuing to draw all of us closer whether we just said yes to you today or we said yes to you many years ago we thank you Lord that you are there to faithfully draw us to who you created us to be we thank you for your love we thank you for your grace we thank you for your mercy we thank you that you are always with us, that you never leave us, you never forsake us, and that, Jesus, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you that you go with us from this place, and you will bring us all back here safely the next time, next Sunday, or during the week, or tonight, whenever it might be, Lord. We thank you that you are in it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Come back tonight, 6 o'clock, right? six o'clock tonight in the green room. Uh, get connected in a group if you're not already during the week, and we hope to see you back next Sunday morning. God bless.